Well, this is August's um, allotment workshop and um, various people last month asked if we could do soft fruit and people had different problems with their, with their fruit. So I've uh, tried to do that. And um, as usual, we do this anthem for Ukraine. And then afterwards, after everything, we will have a look at Richard Baucom. I'm, I'm um, on the last chapter now of his book, The Bible and Ecology. So we'll do a little of that to finish with. And obviously we'll do the breakout groups and if people would like when I finish the presentation, I can take some questions and um, hope it all goes well. <laughs> was quite a powerful mm. anthem for Ukraine. I think it's like a way of saying a prayer for them in their terrible troubles and uh, their ongoing troubles. Uh, and of course, for all the other people in the world who are also suffering from wars and persecutions. So we could start the PowerPoint presentation next. So this is um, a little picture of my, I had an amazing amount of globe artichokes and bees and I've taken lots of short clips of films of them and I'm turning them all into various artworks. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, we'll also be doing soft fruit and members results and the Bible and ecology. If we could go on to the next slide. There's um, that's my friend Viv. She has got a bee garden, um, and also outside her house, she's also growing some different plants. As you can see, they all look very, very healthy. So, next slide. Right, so soft fruit, planting and growing. Um, raspberries, it's suggested there's various links that you can get this, it's recorded on the Green Christian website so you can go to it when it's put up 
and click on these links and get more information. But uh, they suggest to clear the ground in the autumn, obviously dig the holes, put in some potash, and then when you put in the raspberries, cover with manure and mulch. And they also suggest water at the ground level during the summer to avoid blight. Um, otherwise it can get too humid, the, the leaves. And blackberries is much the same, uh, but uh, put in some blood, fish and bone, and then cover and press down hard to avoid air pockets. And uh, I'm going to be doing some of that later on uh, next month. So that's how, to, that's planting soft fruit. Obviously, if it was a tree, you'd have to make a very big hole <laughs> to plant that in. As an aside, I've seen on Facebook that the Japanese are amazing. If the tree is in the way of some building they want to build, they dig up the whole tree and bundle it, roots and all, to somewhere else. They don't just cut it down as we do. Anyway, we'll go on to the next slide. Uh, this is Vib's bee garden with blackberries. And um, it's a bit dormant with bees at the moment, but they hope to start it up again soon. And uh, the blackberries have done very well. Fruit trees, suggest you plant them in the winter. And these different sites give good advice on what kind of tree will suit your space and the wildlife. And you can buy them from these sites as well. The Woodland Trust one does sort of like um, more ordinary woodland trees, like you could get a nice nut tree or something from them. Um, and fruit trees are from the organic catalog company. So pruning, raspberries and blackberries. Uh, the advice is to prune in the early spring when the plant's got most of its carbohydrates stored. But I'm going to be doing it in the autumn because I've got help then. Um, in my London garden, when I lived in London 10 years ago, I had these raspberries that never got pruned and they were always magnificent. I never did anything to them and every year they were just huge numbers of raspberries, but mine are a sad state in my one here. So I've got to do pruning, compost and mulching and I'm going to be lifting some and replanting mm. them to <clears throat> thin them out and give, give them some extra nutrition. Now the advice for fruit trees is to take off the first few years blossom to pour growth into the tree, but I haven't <laughs> had the heart to do this with <laughs> any of mine. Um, we could um, go on to the next slide. Um, Oh yes, there's trees as passiflora flowers and fruit. That looks as if it's done very well this year, very beautiful. Um, so well done, Teresa. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so pruning off the first branches and blossoms is supposed to encourage growth. But my cherries and one pear have done well without any of that. So that's the link on why you should, well, there's lots of links, but that's the one I chose on cutting off and taking the blossoms. So transplanting. Well, I think this is just to do with berries, not with trees, because we're not very Japanese over here. Um, so the raspberries and blackberries, you take them out and Put them in a moist compost and keep misting until they root. So you sort of cut um, under a node and take it and put it in moist compost or um, you can do another method with the whole plant. So that's um, at the bottom there's a site that has nice little pictures of how to prune the different fruits. 
Uh, and um, if you go on to the next slide, oh yes, that's a picture of, that's my allotment. So um, those are the sunflowers and those are the globe artichokes. I've painted the globe artichokes quite a bit. I haven't done the sunflowers yet. I'll, I'll have to think of a way of doing the sunflowers that doesn't make me copy the way Van Gogh paints them. I'll have to think of, I'm working on that, how to paint sunflowers in an original way that doesn't impinge on Van Gogh. Um, but they had a lot of bees on them too. Okay, so next slide. Yes, now this is taking the whole um, fruit bush. So if you've got lots of suckers, it can cause congestion around the primaclanes and floricanes, first and further, you know, first plantings and ones that have been there for a while. So you can cut them off at the base, at the ground level. And if you attempt to pull these out or dig them up, you can do damage to the plant's root system. But if you've got raspberry suckers further along, like I've got a whole lot that are a bit further, so you cut off the ones that are a nuisance in your main site. But if some of them have propagated further along, you can um, just cut down, chop down with a spade and um, cut straight down into the soil between the parent and the sucker in the middle with a spade or a trowel. And this will sever the connecting runner and roots. And then you loosen the soil and gently pull the sucker from the ground, trying to re retain as much of the root system as possible. I'm going to be doing that with quite a lot of my raspberries. I'm going to move them to another patch to give them a bit more room. And it's a patch that's shaded by my cianthus tree. So I think they might do better there as well. So that's, that's um, how to propagate. And uh, one of my neighbors has got a lovely, magnificent blackberry. And she says I can take cuttings from it. So I'm gonna take cuttings from that on Wednesday and put them into like a big bucket of compost and let them just in a dark, um, moist sort of place uh, until they root. And then I'll, I'll have blackberries and raspberries in this new patch. Okay, so the next slide. Yeah, that's, uh, those are, that's what I've been doing when I haven't been doing the allotment. Uh, been working on um, globe artichokes and I mean, I've never had so many bees. I've had, well, I've had loads of bees. They've come from all over Bournemouth, I think. <laughs> and lots of different kinds of bees, <laughs> little ones, big ones all kinds, and some butterflies, but not as many butterflies as usual this year, but lots of bees. Okay, next, next slide. Now these are problems. Uh, someone was asking about what is called white droplet syndrome. And that's where you have a, like a raspberry, but some of it has gone white, some of the little nodules have gone white and they're not so nice to eat. Apparently you can eat them, but um, they're, they're, not, they're not very pleasant. So to prevent it, they suggest to avoid planting in sunny areas that are prone to hot summer winds. So it may help to orientate your rows into a north-south facing position to minimize the effects of sun scald and shading may be helpful as well. But this is recommended only after pollination has occurred. I'm not quite sure how you would shade it, but I suppose, <laughs> well, where I'm moving my raspberries to, they will be more shaded 
anyway, but not terribly shaded. So hopefully that will work. Uh, Sun School is another one I've given a link to. And there's also another thing that can cause it, a stink bugs. They have arrived, I think, from North Africa, but um, they're not yet a problem. So don't have to worry about those just yet. That's one of my neighbours' allotments. She's done really well with her raised beds. I asked if I could take a photo. She said yes. And um, I think she's done really well with her produce. So. Problems in fruit trees and bushes. Now, brown rot in plum trees. It can, um, I think it can affect other trees as well. But one of my trees, I think, has got this. And I'm going to spray it with neem. One of my daughters gave me a huge tub of neem oil, which I'm slowly trying to use. Um, so you, what you do is you put, take one gallon of water. It would have to be warm to start with to dissolve the neem oil because it's quite solid. To two tablespoons, I'd say, of neem oil, and into a sprayer. And I'm going to well, cut off any affected bits that I can see first of all. Although we did prune it quite heavily last year but I'll check it again and then spray it all over. And you can wait two weeks and then give it another spray as well. So I'll probably be doing that to the brown rot on my plum tree. Okay, so next one. Uh, Viv's got a magnificent oak tree. Uh, and she's also got, there's a close-up of the blackberries mm. and the oak tree has given some nice shade to the garden over the summer. So it really is beautiful and a lovely photograph too. Thank you, Viv. Uh, now Sue, Sue of course, now Sue wins first prize because she's done amazingly <laughs> well. Those are her tomatoes. My tomatoes are quite good too, but she's she's really done well. And her tomatoes are catching up and she thinks she's planted them too close together, but looks okay to me. Um, and she had to wait to harvest the garlic before she could put them in. But there's no sign of the dreaded tomato blight for her. I don't think mine have got it either. So I think maybe the hot sun um, was good for the tomatoes this year. And I didn't water mine as much as I did last year. And I think that has helped as well. Well, I couldn't water as much because I, I just dragged the hose down once a week to water everything. I, I, didn't, I didn't manage to water every few days. Okay, so next slide. And those are Sue's onions, and she's pulled them out a month ago, dried on the garden table, and then she's plaited them and stringing the best hundred up in the kitchen. And the others she's put in her chutneys. And she's been lucky and escaped this dreaded onion, onion <laughs> eelworm. Um, and, and also she's escaped tomato blight. So again, very well done, Sue. And those are Sue's courgettes and actually um, they're the, the leeks, I think, but anyway. <laughs> those are leeks, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> leeks and <charred>. sorry. <laughs> but, um, anyway, they're very nice, uh, leeks and chard. And um, again, very well done. And here's some of, of Sue's produce. She's made apricot and date, Christmas spiced beetroot with orange, <laughs> pickled cucumbers with dill, Dixie jars, Christmas fair for her church. So very, very well done. 
gosh <laughs> and i'm i'm hoping that sue may take a few short films of chutney making for us to watch on the next on the next um, allotment workshop if that's possible okay and there's some of sue's produce chard beetroot cucumber courgette and some tomatoes Ooh. and a potato oh yeah he's got the potatoes the potatoes have been better than i dared hope but <laughs> well done you've done so well sue you're an example to us all of how it's can be done so there you go and um, there's leeks and no that's that's kale, kale and cabbage <laughs> kale and cabbage <laughs> yes yes and yes she's netted them at the beginning against pigeon damage i i net mine too um and they're beginning to heart up nicely oh yes they look beautiful really really good well done sue and thank you for sending them all in very very helpful so we are slowly going through the bible and ecology by richard balcom slowly summarizing it and we've reached the last chapter. Now in Revelation, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And Balcom says that New Testament writers assume a knowledge of Old Testament writings. Balcom thinks that Jesus enters the community of creation in the New Testament and that Jesus connects to all of us, creatures and environment. And this is juxtaposed to Platonism and Gnosticism, which are responsible for the dualistic approach of some Christians. Um, for example, um, those that believe heavily in the rapture, they think they're going to be um, taken up to heaven uh, somewhere up there and that uh, presumably the rest of creation can be thrown away and some new creation will be made somewhere else whereas um, other writings suggest Christ was bodily resurrected and will return into all of creation so it's quite a discussion actually I've been on to some American evangelical sites and, and sort of discussing it over there because I think that this is something that is actually of extreme importance for Christianity, America and the, the evangelical right because if they do believe that this world is just here to be thrown away then they're not going to be interested in looking after it and caring for it. So I think we have to try and show that, and, and I have been showing with all the, the writings we've done in previous months of how God um, shows in many ways, in many of the Old Testament readings, that God saw what he had made and he saw that it was good presumably he doesn't want it trashed so that this is this duality and downgrading of nature was compounded by the rise of science under Francis Bacon where the world was seen as something to exploit for the betterment of just human beings factory farming where cruelty to other sentient creatures is seen as justified for allowing cheap meat for everyone is an example of what Old Testament writers would deplore mm. and has led to what Thomas Berry thinks is a wasteland rather than a wonderland. But many Old Testament readings we have studied in previous workshops give treatments and rights to other creatures and also non-sentient creation. So tending our gardens and allotments helps in a small way to guard God's creation he has entrusted to us. 
Okay, thank you. That's, I think, is there, yeah, that's the end of it. Thank you everyone for listening. And if anyone has any questions, comments, um, just a quick one. First of all, Marissa, thank you very much for, for that. And it was a, a lovely way to end it. I'm currently reading um, a book. I don't know that he's a Christian. He may be, but he doesn't parade that. Uh, Jack Fiennes, I think he called uh, F-I-E-N-N-E-S. Um, he's recently published a book called Land Healer. For anyone familiar with um, Isabella Tree's work and Wilding and the work at NEP mm. um, in Sussex, um, he worked for many years at NEP. So he's a sort of child of NEP, if you like. Um, and there's a huge chapter there all on soil. And it's all about, uh, I mean, a lot of it is quite um, technical, um, but it's all showing just how the 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 modern factory farming that has really proliferated and got worse since the second world war um and the chemical f uh, firms um you know parading and making a lot of money out of fertilizers and insecticides and herbicides and all the rest of it and he's turned he now works at hokum and um uh, mm -hmm. Cook of Hokum, I remember being taught oh. at school, who invented the ro <laughs> rotation system. Um, and he's been there for a few years now and is turning the whole farming at Hokum round so that there's more room for um, wildlife and the soil is improving. Um, so, and with, with the proviso always that um, you have to make a farm. Um, uh, to, to, to be successful in, in terms of making enough money to keep going. Um, but it's perfectly possible and we could actually reverse this awful devastation of our, of our soils and everything. And although this is talking on the grand scale on a big farm, um, it actually applies to every one of us in our little tiny plots and window boxes, allotments, gardens, whatever. So I recommend it. it. It took a bit of getting into this book, but then it took off and it's really interesting to read. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe um, maybe Barbara could share it. Um, I, I can say, yes, it's just called Land Healer. Um, can, he, he, can you send me an email, Sue? Yeah, of course, Barbara. I'll yeah. put it in the message I send around afterwards when yeah. the video yeah. is ready and so forth. Yeah. Thank you. I want to know how you got a red cabbage to heart up. <laughs> well, I just left it. I didn't know. <laughs> no, no magic from me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, we don't normally eat cabbages, but I do like red cabbages. And I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And uh, when I took the net off, because I just, I was watering them through the netting and and it's a bit of a fiddle to take the, the, the netting off. And when I did, I was just amazed by this <laughs> creation. It's even bigger than the picture you've just shown now. I saw it this morning. I love red cabbage and Ed tried growing it several years and he didn't succeed. Yeah. <laughs> well, it might go belly up before I get to eat it, but <laughs> it looks all right at the moment. A whole row of them. <laughs> well done. James has got his hand up. James has gone. Unmute yourself. Sorry, yeah. I've got several questions, but I'm assuming we're breaking into groups, so that might be the best place to ask them. One thing which is um, relevant to what you were talking about with soft fruit is that we have raspberries and they've almost produced only one end produced a few, a few raspberries, but only about five or six. Mm. I'm wondering what you meant by the runners and whether it's runners that have come up, because it's very green, looks quite lush, but it produced no flowers. Now, could it be, run, uh, could it be runners that have come up? Because in, in the winter, it was nothing. You wouldn't have known that anything was there at all. And the, these um, they, they grow up from the roots each year. 
But they they um, are they summer fruiting or autumn? Yes, uh, yeah, they fruit about mm, July. Yeah, well, they normally fruit on last year's growth. So if these if these green shoots came up this spring, they'll fruit next year, not this year. Ah. So don't cut them off, or you'll get no oh. fruit next year either. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I leave. I just leave them, or just prune mm. them. Oh, the no. relevant time. Just leave them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you just cut off the older ones, the sort of brown ones that aren't doing anything. Right, yeah. And and the ones that fruited this year, which should say only one end and it was only a few, and they're looking but, a bit a bit brown now. Those are the ones you can cut down. Right. Le leaving the fresh ones to fruit mm. next year. And then they get cut down next year and the new ones that come up next year will be kept for 2024 and so, so on. it works like on a two-year cycle then yeah yeah but you can change you can change summer to autumn fruiting ones it all depends what time of year you cut them the old ones down hmm. so uh, if you cut the old ones down if you leave them um you know until the autumn then they will send up suckers that will fruit up fruit next year. Um, yeah, I think that's the way it works. You can certainly change the time by cutting them down either earlier or later and, and have either summer or autumn fruiting raspberries because I've done half and half. So I've got them, they started, I've got some yellow raspberries and they started fruiting, I should think six or seven weeks ago. And then I've got some others next to them that I left until the autumn. And they've got flowers on them now, so we'll hopefully fruit in the next few weeks. All right, yeah. But yeah. you can extend the season that way according to how you prune them or when you prune them. <laughs> that's very interesting. That's a good idea. Yes. That's that's from Bob Flowerdew on Gardens Question Time, I think. Okay. Oh, he knows a thing or two. I think that's how I learned it, and it works. Thank <laughs> you.